Welcome to The Good Word. My name is Vincent Goodwill, Senior NBA Reporter for Yahoo Sports. We are part of the Ball Don't Lie podcast. Get us wherever you get your podcast. And of course, we are also on YouTube. So you see the gentleman sitting next to me. He is a good friend of mine. He is the host, a co-host rather, on Fox Sports 1's First Things First. He is the host of What's Right with Nick Wright that he hosts alongside his son, Demonte Bird. Nick Wright, how you What's doing, What's up, man? Vinny? Thanks for having me on. It's been too long. Good to see you. Good to talk to you. Uh, we got a lot of good stuff to get into. I appreciate you having me. Hey, man, I have been wanting to have you on for a while. So luckily, uh, you found some time in your schedule to come and sit with us. Um, Nick, of yeah, course, right we got some- when we're done with the 90s, it's just perfect. Just right when we we done with the 90s. So it's a perfect timing for this. I didn't, you know, I didn't cause that. I mean, I kind of did, but I didn't. The uh, I, I I don't I can't necessarily uh, confirm or deny any uh, connection I have to that TikTok trend. But go ahead, Bob. I feel like you did. I'm not on TikTok. I just if I get things, I have the app. Like I'm not real yes. active on there, and Correct. that just made me say I'm just really old. That's all. Yeah, this made me say I'm really old. And Nick, you're older than me. No, you're I am older than, than you. What I found interesting, not to hijack it, because I know yeah, we're gonna yeah. talk about a million things. There are prior to this whole we're done with the 90s where people decided to, you know, go back and actually watch, you know, basketball from the greatest era ever and draw their own conclusions. What uh what I found so interesting is prior to like two weeks ago, at least for me, many of the most vocal Jordan uh I don't know what the right word is, sycophants, promoters, whatever, were people younger than both of us. Where people who you know, there obviously is the older guard media, but on social media, some of the most vocal ones were people younger than both of us who I actually think are Kobe fans. And their <laughs> and their horse in this race is actually a roundabout defense of Kobe Bryant being the second best player ever to Michael Jordan. And I think that's where it came. And now it's come full circle to where, not full circle, but now it's come to where, you know, uh, uh, so many of the people are like, wait a minute, this guy didn't dribble with his left hand are very young people. And that maybe has gone a touch too far, but who knows? But go ahead. We can talk about anything you want. Nick, it's completely gone too far. Like, the way that we can cherry pick clips, like when the day comes that people see LeBron getting torched by J.J. Barea and J.J. Redick, baby, that's going to be yeah. a tough well, day for you know a lot what? of folks. That's fine. You, you know what? And, and here's the here is I would argue the difference. When those days happened in real time, he was killed for it. That is the distinction mm. between the coverage of. LeBron James and the contemporary coverage of Michael Jordan, which was once the Bulls started winning, there was n- there was n- the only cr- even lightly critical coverage of Michael resulted in blackballing of outlets. And because of that, and everyone was making money off it, because of that, there was, you know, it, not only a kid's glove treatment, but post-career a bit of a airbrushing Kate Middleton style of the record of the where, you know what, we are going to act as if the 1995 season didn't happen. We are going to do things that that are just going to, you know, the, the end of the story is this guy never failed and was the greatest ever. LeBron's story has been far more uh, complicated and tumultuous and when, J- when they lost to the Mavs, no one is going to be able to argue when they lost to the Mavs. Oh, that we people didn't discuss it. People said he was cooked. He was done. He was a fraud. So I don't know. I, I, I think one guy's historical record will age quite well. But I know that's not even why you had me on. I just had to. This is my first opportunity to do any media since this TikTok trend really took off. And I just I'm also not on TikTok, but I do, you know. I do get sent things on TikTok, and I and, and these kids, the kids are all right, as they say. The kids are figuring some stuff out. No, the kids are dumb. <laughs> like, th- there's a reason that kids are kids, okay? And, and I'm not a person that says everything that's old is great and everything that's new stinks. I don't sit there 
nor am I a member of Jordan Hive, as people might know. I grew up in Detroit. OK, that means it was ingrained in my blood that I am not going to be a Michael Jordan sycophant, as you like to mm -hmm. say. But I do have eyes. And I think the great thing about Nick, Nick would have been a great lawyer. I think, Nick, you probably could have gotten OJ off with Johnny Cochran. You could have been on that defense team because you have a great talent, a gift of presenting an argument and making the argument greater than like the actual historical fact. Like, you know what they always say, man, the truth is the greatest defense. People are giving me all this credit. Like I'm, I, like I'm all of a sudden pulling a rabbit out of a hat. I'm just presenting obvious facts mm. that folks have decided to twist their brains around. And here's the other thing, if I may, mm -hmm. that's happening to Michael. That is unfair but time comes for everyone. And this will, if you want to feel old, this is going to make you feel old. The amount, the distance between the Bulls' 72 win season. I know where you're going. Which yep. was the moment. I understand the statue said the greatest there ever was, the greatest there ever will be when he retired the first time. I get that part of it. But the distance between when they had the 72 win season, when he came back and they won the fourth championship, that was when Michael was kind of universally regarded as the greatest player ever. There was no real argument against it publicly at that point. The distance in time between that championship and Russell's last championship is the same amount of time between that championship and right now. And that is, and so if people were, you know, in 1996 being like, hold on a minute, what about Bill Russell's 11 rings? And people were like, man, forget you. That was th almost 30 years ago. It's a different era of basketball. It feels weird to say, mm -hmm. but the 72 win season was almost 30 years ago and a different era of basketball. And so I think that you are, I, I forgot, I think Klosterman made this point that there are very few things across all of pop culture, sports, media, music, anything, that last longer than the last person who saw it happen. You know, like that once yeah, yeah, the, I get what you mean, yeah. And so Babe Ruth is one of those right. people, right? Right. Beethoven, Mozart, Shakespeare, those are those people. In sports, like, I don't know, like, I, Bill Russell might be, but he might not be. Like, Bill Russell might get a bit of the Jordan. Now, maybe because Russell has the civil rights part of it and the, the, the where, but Michael Jordan obviously will. He clears that bar. Right. But many of these, it gets harder and harder The once you get, there's only a handful of things in pop culture history that have lasted longer than 50 years. Like in music, the Beatles are one of the only, you know, one of the only things. I think Michael Jackson will be. At this yep. point, it feels like Taylor Swift might be beyond, but there's not many. We don't know, you know what I mean? And so for, it is weird to say, but we are getting to the point to where the people who actually lived and breathed the yeah. full Jordan story are getting old. I'm damn near 40, and I, the you know, that means that I was a toddler when he won his first MVP. And so that, so that is, and so I do think there is an element of that happening here, which is a unique one. Well, I want to say it's a counter, but I think what you just touched on is very few things actually stand as institutions, and you can even find it today. There's probably generally less respect for things that we consider institutional. We're, we're going to challenge more things that we've been told more than ever. I will say this. If sports is a level of artistry, you find me someone who has sung better than Aretha Franklin because they only made one of those. They only made one sure. Whitney Houston, and we've had all the information, technology, all the blueprints, and we haven't produced anything better than that. And not to say that Michael Jordan is analogous to that, 
But what I will say is this, as far as eras, and I think this is where we have to be really, really careful. This is kind of where you have to listen to the elders. Not that I'm an elder, but listen to the elders on this. It was a completely different game in the 90s. And it was a game with, in terms of the rules and the structure and the way teams were built. Those games were built for seven footers to dominate and seven Correct. footers to win. And this dude was 6'6 six, six and 195 pounds in that era and dominated even through the expansion. I'm, I'm the biggest person that says, Nick, expansion might be the greatest impediment to the Jordan argument because you added six teams from 1988 to 1995 and you didn't yes. have the talent to catch up with the teams. And now you have to add two teams because the talent is so great. I'm com That's the one argument I will give. But the argument against that, that I will say against LeBron, is that LeBron has made the game for him where the floor is spread and he can bully everybody down the lane and he's bigger and faster than everybody else. I won't say the sliders are there for him, but he's playing this on all, maybe all starter, not all rookie, but well, all starter. Well, and I okay, felt like so Jordan I, was playing on rules on all Madden. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, that last piece I disagree with. I also think LeBron's career has been so long. It has, yeah, it, it yeah. is, tr it has gone across multiple eras and multiple different versions. But in general, I agree with you that the greatest athletes ever, you drop them in any era and they figure it out. They adjust. They, you know, they, there are there are exceptions to it. Like I do think is the that there are. I wonder as great as a true winner and leader as Russell was because of his size. You right. know how much of an impact would he have been able to have? Not not on the same level, but he still would have been a great. Like there are so and I, the idea that. The, you know, that Magic Johnson wouldn't have been amazing in any era, I think is ludicrous. Same with Jordan, same with LeBron. My frustration is somewhat twofold. One is, you are having a level-headed conversation about this that, a lot, that most people won't, which is most people do it only in one direction, which is they, sit, they act as if everything was harder in the previous era, when obviously it was not. And when people bring up things such as hand checking, not recognizing, okay, well, that would mean LeBron would be allowed to do that. And what would peak of his powers, 6'8", 240 pound LeBron James be like as a defender with that tool in his toolbox? Seems like it would be, it would be relevant. And then the, the other one that kills me on really kills me, and then we can move on, on the Jordan thing is everyone seems to agree, myself included, this was an insanely competitive individual. If competitiveness could be measured, maybe the all-time most competitive athlete across any sport ever. And then in the same breath, and they're like, but he was, even by his era standards, a terrible range shooter because he didn't care about it. That doesn't make sense to me. The idea that, oh, if he wanted to be good at three-point shooting, he would have been. But he didn't want to be. No, I kind of think he wanted to be awesome at everything. And that was a tool that was not in his toolbox, as evidenced by the fact that when they brought the line in for those two years, he was excellent. And then the moment they moved it back out, he was bad again, which leads me to believe for now, if people want to argue, well, he would have focused on that more, practiced that more and gotten better at it in today's era. Fine. But this idea that he had that he could have ever been excellent at it. I think Michael wanted to be excellent at everything and the best at everything, whether it was pitching nickels Playing baseball, playing basketball, you know, shorting GameStop, any of the above. I think he wanted to be great at all of it. And I think it's unfair to say, I think if in 30 years people are like, oh, if LeBron wanted to be a 90% free throw shooter, he would have been. That'd be ridiculous. It's like, right. no, it's a, you know, he's not because he's not.
So I just want to have an honest argument. That's all. But we no, can also I, talk I, about today's. I, I I do think as a as a postscript to that, he, operating in the triangle offense, which he was in from 1989 until the end of his Bulls career, the three point shot was still in his infancy, and the triangle offense did not was not created for that. They are, that offense was created in the 70s. There was no three-point shot then. So it wasn't going to be emphasized and the better use of him was going to be from 18 feet and in. I think I you agree would, with that. I agree you know with that. I mean? But my point is, but that doesn't change the fact that for that even by the standards and averages of the era, he was below average at. So and so that that that's the only point. I, the, I agree. I'm not talking about the volume of it. I'm talking purely at it, that. It, that I think every shot Michael took, he wanted to make. For sure. So the ones he missed, I don't think we can be like, ah, he didn't care. And that's where a lot of the to me myth making has come into it, where it's like, oh, he didn't, he was didn't want to win championships the years he didn't. No, he did. And by the way, this is also why I'm not a count the rings person. You look back on those last two years, the Bulls didn't win the title. The two Pistons years, right? Yep. That was not because Michael wasn't good enough. Right. That was because there were some bad SOBs in Detroit that had a better team. And was Michael at that was Michael at that point better than Isaiah? He was, but Isaiah had the better team. And now you and I are you, me, Chris Broussard, there are only a handful of people that I think give Isaiah his due. Yes. Because, like you said, Jordan was, one of the reasons Jordan was so special is because he was so small. I know he's not small, but compared to everyone who had ever led their team to a title across NBA history, he was the smallest except for Zeke. And now we have 80 years of the NBA, and we have two guys under 6'6", under Jordan's height, who have been the leading force on champions, a, the unquestioned leading force on right. champions, certainly on multi-time champions, and that's Zeke and Steph. And so, there, there, you, yes, it has to be acknowledged that th there is a reason that Akeem and Sam Bowie went ahead of Michael. And it was because, well, I'm going to take the tall guy because it's a league all about tall guys. And he changed the math on that. Listen, this is why I've always said there's no shame in being the third greatest ever at something. And exactly. I, I don't know that's, why I'm and that's why, And that's why I have LeBron as number three. So you completely understand do my you argument have, there. Do you have Kareem as two? No, no. I, I used to have Kareem as two. And I think the last time we actually talked about this on air when I was a guest on on First Things First, I think it was like 2018, I had LeBron as three and Kareem as two. Okay. But I think I'm not a big fan of longevity as being the argument for why you are greater than someone. But if one of your arguments is longevity with a comparable player, LeBron's back end of his career is greater than Kareem's back end of his career by a country mile. I think Kareem's last great Kareem year was 86, and then they turned the team over to Magic, and he won two more titles on the sure. back end of that with, with Magic as, as lead dog. And I will say this, especially as because people who know me know that, you know, I am a bad, a child of the bad boys. The greatest Jordan thing, because I'm like you, I don't hold the count the rings. I'm not a count the rings guy. Like, once you're a champion, you're a champion in my book. Like, I don't view Kobe's five a different way than I view LeBron's four or Jordan's six, at least not in, sure. in a direct way. But I will say this. Those two Piston years that they won championships, they lost a total of two games in non-Bull series. They went and ran rough shot through the entire playoffs except when they went against Michael Jordan. And all those series, they lost two games. Against the Bulls, they gave up five. Like, right. Jordan no, that's, Jordan that's, stole games that he shouldn't have stolen. That it, 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 Right. And so that's where, and this is where, and this is where I do enjoy, not as much as the Jordan versus LeBron conversation, but the, like, actual basketball history conversation. Like, I can... You, one could make an Jordan. I think Jordan's greatest series ever is the finals against the Suns. But aside, remove that. Uh, so let's now talk second greatest series ever, I guess. You could make an argument that aside from that Suns series, two of Jordan's three best series ever 
were in losses. You can make that argument. I don't, you know what I mean? I don't know that yeah, it's yeah. necessarily true, but you can make it. Just like I think you can make an argument. The greatest series Braun ever played was the 09 conference finals against the Magic. You know what I mean? Which was which gets forgotten in history. They lost eight. in six. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was and a game the whole thing, it was bananas. Or that the greatest playoff run he ever had was 2018. Mm-hmm. I actually think that. You know what I mean? I think that it culminated in the greatest game anyone's ever played, game one of the 2018 finals. That game was a loss. The fi- this playoff run ended in being swept in the finals, but I watched it. And I watched this, you know what I mean? And so there is an element of nuance that should be, uh, you know, assessed here. So is your number three magic? My number three is, like, I'm trying to figure out, and Bo, Bomani Jones makes this great point of since when did we know that LeBron actually passed magic? And I told him we never contextualize magic beyond greatest point guard of all time. We never actually had a discussion on where magic fit. And I know you have a discussion on where magic fit. You have not checked out Nick Wright's greatest 50 players of the last 50 years. I think he did. I think you did that two years ago and you did individual po- podcasts on every player in the past 50 years that ranked on the list. Um, regrettably, Scottie Pippen was one of them. Um, but yeah, like, yes. But, but, I, I, well, So that's going to kill me too. So that is going to kill me. Because I feel like, so the reason I asked you, so that's fine. My, the ahead, reason ahead, I even asked you is, it, it, as long as people's top four is Kareem, LeBron, Magic, and Michael, we can have a real conversation about stuff. You know what I mean? I almost put, yeah, yeah. Put, set, set the pre-Kareem guys, Russell and Wilt aside. They, uh, they almost belong in a different categorization because of the era. Um, but th- those, in my opinion, have yeah. to be the top four. And then we can, you know what I mean? We can have a discussion from there. The, the, but it, I must say, and I know you want to talk about today's games, and so we can do that. <laughs> the concerted effort to minimize Scottie Pippen in service of promoting Michael Jordan is, I think, grotesque. Someone explain the 94 season to me. Explain it to me. I will explain. Here's the thing. This is where I won't say the Detroit comes in in me. You explain the 94 season. I'll explain the 95 season before Jordan came back. Because there are one year sample sizes that are total anomalies. And I think Pippen, while he had a great season, cost the Bulls the second round series against the Knicks and then couldn't sustain whatever he had going the next year because they were a barely 500 team. And then he was begging Michael Jordan to come so, back. So hold on, wait. So they the Bulls, you're saying in 1995, were barely 500 yes. before Jordan came back. Okay. They were 34 and 31. So three games over. Michael yep. Jordan played five seasons of his career without Scottie Pippen. How many of those five seasons was he above 500? Zero. Zero. So Zero. Do, you know how many points, do you know how many points Scottie Pippen scored his rookie year? I'm just, I listen, I, well, all I'm saying is I think it is – I think the the idea the 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 only reason that folks in my opinion would have to try to act like Pippen was not a who would be a good comp right now for Scotty like as I would say it, it again not similar stylistically at all but similar as far as hierarchy of the league that Apex okay. Apex Scotty was not in in the similar vicinity of a Devin Booker or a Jason Tatum is crazy to me. Where he was, Apex Scotty was somewhere from the fifth to ninth best player in the sport. And again, they, they were not similar players. I'm just trying to think of a contextualizing yeah, yeah, of where nobody ever, I and maybe Celtics fans will get mad at me. I've never once watched Jason Tatum and been like, I think he might be the best player in the league. Not a day of my life if I thought he's the best player in the league. Same with Booker. But they each have been, at their peak, you know, clear All-NBA guys, excellent players. And so the idea that now we're going to act as if Pippen was not that in the early 90s, I just, I think that's revisionist history. I think acting like Scotty was not considered a, a, the, maybe the best, not maybe, the best wing defender in the league, him and Gary Payton could, you know, you argue back and forth. One's a point guard defender, one's a kind of guard more length. And 
a guy who was a reliable 20 points along with being able to uh, move the ball and rebound. He was wildly important and a great player. And then the first year he got a chance to do it without Michael, they won 54 games. Like, that's unfair. It's just, you're not... You're not the lead dog on a team with no other All-Stars and win 54 games and be a nobody. That's unfair. Well, Horace Grant was an All-Star in 94, and they also picked up Tony Kukoc, and people didn't know who Tony was, and Tony was an excellent player. To cross off the point, because you're you're right to some degree, and actually my best friend will be listening to this. He was a big Scottie Pippen guy. He's probably smiling from ear to ear, right? But I will say this about Scottie. I think Scottie has been overrated and also overlooked if both can be true believe it or not because Scottie Pippen his rookie year he averaged 10 points a game and everybody's saying Michael Jordan never won a playoff series against Scotty without Scotty and Mike averaged 45 points a game in that first round 88 playoff series against the Cleveland Cavaliers if all That's Mike great. needed if all Mike needed was 10 points a game from Scottie Pippen that meant the Bulls did a terrible job of surrounding him with players because if all he needed was Scottie Pippen they could have they could have came up with something better than that a lot quicker. Okay, well, well, I mean, they got. I mean, it was only three years, and again, this is where. And now we're going to do the whole damn pot on this. I'm sorry. <laughs> I no, we're not. I didn't no, we're to, not. I, it, but the, 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 the we can just move on. But this is yeah, yeah, this yeah. is this is where I think people are somewhat disingenuous. People are not making the argument that it should be hung around Jordan's neck. That he couldn't win, that didn't win a championship, you know, without Scotty. If people bring up the point that he played five years without him and never finished above 500, that is a, at least semi relevant data point. It's not that you, that, and people can say, oh, and then, but then that first year with Scotty. When Scotty only averaged 10 points, what did the Bulls do that year? Got cooked in round two. It's not like Scotty got their average 10 and they were contending. No, it was finally you're above 500 for the first time. And finally, you don't get swept in round one. Like those are those. It, it, it is people can 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 get upset about it. And this is where now like time comes for everyone. Forever, the narrative, it was just decided that, well, anyone who brings up the Wizards years has lost the argument. It's like that's insane and ludicrous. But now when the guy who's on his heels is older than he than Michael was when he started with the Wizards, and folks are killing that guy for getting swept in the conference finals, well, now we have to have an honest argument. And so I... So I, I, I'm not killing Michael for anything. I am simply saying it is there is an element of this debate. And what frustrates me is there is nothing factually true that you can say about LeBron's career that if you say it, I say, well, that doesn't count. That's unfair. That's, that's one of those years that we all know was fake. But a third of Jordan's career, the, the three years pre-Scotty and the two years on the back end, that is five of his 15 years. I'll add a sixth, which was the 95 season. That's six of 15. If someone brings it up, that's 40% of his career, brings up any of those seasons, folks say, well, that's ridiculous. How can you even talk about those? Because they fucking happened, pardon me, is how I can talk about them. Because games were played, a champion was crowned, they had standings, they had a playoff series. And and so I just think we talk about all of it and let the chips fall where they may. And as the smart kids on TikTok said, we done with the 90s, bro. Yeah, here we go. I knew Nick was going to I knew Nick was going to finish it. Once again, it's I have no problem with presenting of facts. I have a issue with ignoring context. And okay. I will finish with this. That yeah. year and that I Jordan finally didn't get swept out of the first round, he won MVP and Defensive Player of the Year, something nobody has done. Oh, LeBron, LeBron is, I mean, not LeBron. LeBron came close Akeem, to doing it. Probably should have done it. Oh, he should have done it. Hakeem did the, it and Giannis did it. 
Akeem Giannis and Giannis did it, and LeBron should have done it in 2013. In 2013, the guy who won yep. Defensive Player of the Year yep. was third team all defense. It's one of the craziest things that's ever happened. Do you you do you remember that with Marc Gasol? Yeah, Marc Gasol yeah. was center. Two other centers tied for first team all defense. So then he who finished third at his position for all defense got a second team, even though there is no such thing as third team all defense. But they gave two first team all defensive centers because they tied. Marcus all got second team all defense, one defense player of the year. Yeah, no, that's he did absolutely. Jordan did do that, and then and that season that you're talking is Jordan's third year. You're talking about right that he did that, or was his fourth year? Fourth was it his year, first 88. year with Scotty, or without? Was it without Scott? That was his. That was his first. That was Scotty Pippen as a rookie. As Scotty Pippen as a rookie. That's when Jordan because the year before is when Jordan averaged thirty seven. Yep. In year three, when he yep. averaged 37 and then got swept in round one. Okay, yeah, got it. <laughs> he did, we'll and it's back. not fair to say he got swept in round one every year. He did get a game off Moncrief his rookie year. He got one game, then he got swept. The great Nick Wright, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be back right after this break to talk about gambling and the surging Lakers. Two things I know Nick is very adept at discussing. We'll be right back with Nick Wright. Right back on the good work with Nick Wright. Nick uh, patient zero is the anniversary of actually the NBA shutting down its league today from four years ago. It's like amazing that we have come so far from that day and that day still rings out. And in the anniversary of that day, Nick, patient zero, Rudy Gobert decides to open up a can of worms when he did the uh, the money reference to Scott Foster on Friday night and the league hammered him for $100,000. And yeah. Nick, you are in the gambling space. And it's yeah. kind of been this taboo discussion because almost everybody has been sort of in bed with the gambling companies. Yep. I spin it forward to ask you, is it a slippery slope that we are entering? Is Rudy Gobert right message, wrong messenger? Like, how does all this hit you? Because your poker, your parlays. Like, tell me how this hits the, you. Well, yeah, listen, the I, I I've been a gambler my entire life. Okay, I'll tell a very quick story. When I was 11 years old, we got a small pool table in the basement of my house. And my dad brought me down there and we played nine ball. $3 on the five, $5 on the nine. And I won like 28 bucks or something. And then he said, all right, you got to give me a chance to get even. Let's up the stakes. And by the end of the night, I owed him $112. Um, and I was, I think, 11 years old. Did and you have to pay it? He made me pay it. I didn't have a job. I didn't really have a way to pay it. He was like, you're going to pay me $11 a month for the next year. And I did the math in my head. I'm like, hold on. That's more than I owe you. He's like, yeah, that's the juice. You're going to find, you're going to pay me. Uh, and, you know, little did I know that my dad, before straightening his life out, getting on the fire department, being becoming a kind of a pillar of the Kansas City community, was a professional gambler. Uh, I think I can say this now. It's 50 years ago. But I mean, was, you know, did a lot, you know, was, ran games, was in the space on the kind of streets of Kansas City. And the reason my dad doesn't have the nose I have is because when he was a teenager, he hustled a guy in, in a pool match and the guy broke his nose with a pool cue. And when you break your nose, they, you know what I mean? That's basically what a yeah, nose job yeah. is. Um, and so, so I didn't know. So my dad did all this thinking it would teach me that gambling's risky and bad. Instead, it taught me, holy moly, you can make a lot of money gambling if you know what you're doing. <laughs> so it's just, it's like the old, uh, you're going to smoke the whole pack of cigarettes. And instead of getting sick to your stomach, you're like, these things are delicious. I'm going to, I'm addicted now. Um, so I say all that to say this, I don't think it's without risk. And I do think that I think gambling should be legal. I think it should, I think a, a, an adult should be able to go gamble. I think there was an unintended consequence with gambling becoming legal at the exact same time everyone does everything on their phones. Mm, so yeah, I think yeah. gambling being legal, if it were simply what it was at any point in time prior to 10 years ago, where if you wanted to, like, if they ma just made it legal everywhere, but you had to walk into a brick-and-mortar casino, 
and place a bet, I think there would be a lot, I think a lot of what people are worried about would be minimized. I think the the ease of, I can just do everything on my phone is, you know, is going to be something that can have some unintended consequences. Like you said, the point Bomani made, Haralabob made this point, you know, the greatest NBA yep. gambler of all time. And it's right, is that all, I say all that while, you know, making money from gambling. And so I, the, and so I, I recognize there is a level of, I don't know if folks want to call it hypocrisy, but us being compromised on it, I think is a legitimate piece of it. Where I think the NBA is, ri- risky is the wrong word, is I don't, I, I, I think anybody that thinks professional, p- professional players would ever fix a game don't understand how difficult getting big dollars down on any game is and how much money these guys are making. So it, right. it, it is, it, it, it is almost impossible unless you are a well-known whale bad gambler to get more than $40,000 down on any individual basketball game. And I understand 40 grand is a lot of money, but not compared to any NBA contract. A 10 day in the NBA is 200 grand. So right. any player that would have the ball in their hands enough to impact a game like that, it, the risk v reward doesn't exist. So I don't worry about players fixing games. I do think that the refs part of it is going to be an ongoing question fans have and concern for the league. And Scott Foster in particular, if you remember when the NBA did have a ref scandal with Tim yep. Donaghy, Scott Foster was all over that guy's call logs. And I'm not I'm not making any allegations. I'm simply saying there is no person Tim Donaghy called more other than the people he was betting with more than Scott Foster. So there's already like a weird feel there I think for certain people, and again, I I'm not I am not accusing Scott Foster of anything. I'm simply saying that I think there is going to be, I there is going to be. But you said it's been four years to the day since the pan since the Gobert pandemic day. Um, I think between now and four years from today, one of our major sports is going to have some type of gambling scandal. And I don't think it will involve a player. I think it will involve an official. And it's just tough. Like, none of the officials make millions of dollars. Right. And so while I said for a player, 40 grand is not going to move the needle, for someone who makes 150, 40 grand sure as hell might, you know what I mean? Pay off your car, pay off your mortgage. And so I, I think it's a tough spot. Now, I also think that gambling being legal makes it more likely you can catch that. Because because it's not being done, you know, in the shadows. In the darkness, yeah. It's been it's been it, done done in the light. Yeah, you can catch right. it. Right, yeah, and so yeah. I, but I, I think that the all of the leagues basically treating gambling as this verboten, awful thing, and then immediately being able to bet in arenas was a very fast. I've been. I started doing. I graduated college in 07. when I first got on the radio in Kansas City, Vinny. If we made a bet amongst our show hosts, we had to, we weren't allowed to say dollars. We'll be like, it would be like, I'll bet you 20 bagels that the Chiefs <laughs> win this weekend. And it was our, our bosses were like, no, you can't say your, to go from that to where all of us are like, here's my same game parlay was a right. very fast, very fast change in how we accept it, and you know what I mean? What everyone thinks is fine. That's definitely yeah. true. I think the world moves faster than ever, quicker than ever, and it's really hard for us to get in front of things. And not just sports and sports gambling, but just in general with the way that we consume information. One last thing with Nick Wright, because he's up against it. Nick, your Lakers have, in in recent week, they have beat, in the recent last week, they beat Oklahoma City, the number one seed in the West. They yeah. beat the Milwaukee Bucks without LeBron James in a comeback win. And last yeah. night they beat the Minnesota Timberwolves, Sands, Carl Towns, Sands, Rudy Gobert. They're now six games over 500, but still sitting in ninth. 
A, are you resigned to them being in that spot in the play? And do you think they can get up to six? And B, how optimistic are you feeling about that? All right. So I actually don't think I think the the way the play in is discussed is I don't want to say misleading. I think it. I, yeah, but I there's a the difference point, between seven and eight and nine and ten. It, there is a massive difference. It is a enormous difference. I don't view being the seven or the eight as all that risky. I understand it feels like it is, but certainly the seven I don't view as that risky. Being the nine, 10, on the other hand, I view as you're screwed. You're screwed because if you happen to win back to back must win games, the second of which will be a road game if you're the 10 seed, both of which, you then have to immediately play the one seed. So what you have to do essentially is win six out of nine, two of which are single elimination. Um, and then, then the next seven, you're a massive dog. So I think the nine ten is just an impossible spot. And I think we've only seen one team ever that the Grizzlies team that after, after LeBron yeah. hit that shot against the Warriors in the eight, yep. seven, eight game, uh, then the Grizzlies beat the Warriors. So I, I think for the Lakers, it is incredibly important to move out of the nine line. And I think that the Warriors are going to stay where they're at. And then the quest, the Lakers lost to the Kings the other day was brutal because yeah. now the Kings are up 3-0 on the season series. So you can't win that tiebreaker. And But I think if they get to the 7-8 line, they're okay. Here's what I think about the Lakers. And it's kind of what I think about most teams in the West. You're just really hoping someone else can beat Denver for you because yep, you can't. Yep, yep. You know, like, and so I know that folks will think that this is, ah, uh, you guys talk too much about the Lakers, they're the ninth seed. Okay, but they're three games out of the sixth seed. LeBron is also, I, LeBron was playing very well pre-All-Star, post-All-Star. LeBron's been out of his mind. And, and he's healthy and seems spry and all of this. Nobody wants to see the Lakers across from them in the bracket. I think they would beat Oklahoma City. I do think that. Yeah, they're, they're bigger. Minnesota's, they would just beat them up. They're just bigger and thicker. They would just yeah, beat them and, up. And the experience wise. level matters. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? And so, like, those things. I, I think that Minnesota, a full strength Minnesota is interesting, but I don't know if they're going to be full strength. And, you know, and so that's that's a rough spot. The problem is everyone in the West, their path to the finals is. And if someone can just upset Denver, like there, and so, like, let's say on the, to speak of the play-in stuff, let's say on the last day of the season, and I don't think this will be the case, but Denver is locked into the three. Mm. And the Lakers are in a spot where they've won a bunch of games. If we win, we move out of the play-in into the six. If we lose, we're the seven. I'd throw the game. I'd, I'd rest everyone. I would opt into being in the play-in over opting into playing Denver in round one. I, I truly would. And so, assuming Denver's full strength and fully, you know what I mean? Fully, right, right, right. Nobody's gotten hurt. But I do think the Lakers are dangerous. Like, do you think I'm being crazy there? Like, I think the Lakers can beat anyone in the West in a series other than Denver. I, I tend to agree with you there, but I think everything is so closely packed in there's nobody that can't beat anybody except for denver i believe in a seven game series so do i think you, it, do i think i think sacramento can if you get the right matchup sacramento like we've seen sacramento can beat the lakers and because of just styles make fights and but they, they won't play in got the nobody to deal with the iron fox they got nobody, nobody to guard the point of attack at all um maybe when vanderbilt comes back he could help a little but he's not fat nobody's fast enough one of my favorite moments of watching basketball ever. My son was a high, high level high school basketball player in Texas. Um, he played a little college basketball in California and like he's a big kid, great athlete, and played on he played on a AU team with Quentin Grimes. Uh oh, okay. Okay. and so uh Quentin was two years younger than my son, was the youngest kid on the team and the best player. It's like, oh, that guy's a pro. Um, but regardless. Uh, when my su one summer we were at some AAU tournament in Houston and in between games, I went over to the other gym and there was this kid who was just faster than anyone I'd ever seen up that close on the court. 
and he scored, I think, 40 points in the first half of a running clock AAU game, and it was De'Aaron Fox. <laughs> it was De'Aaron Fox. It was just like, I have the ball, I have a layup. I have the ball, I have a layup. Like, you can't stay in front of me. But for the Lakers, on the good side of it is, the only way they could really play the Kings, likely it'd be like the conference finals. Because, yeah. the, you know what I mean? They're both going to be on, on the, the bad side of the side bracket. Of the bracket. Yeah. Yeah. And so I don't think they have to worry about the Kings. So, I don't know. No. They don't. And I just think the Western playoffs, which is where I'll be stationed, which means I'll be staying up late and my body clock will be all all thrown to hell this year. I just think it'll be really interesting because I think the Lakers are built in such a way. They're built more for playoff basketball than they are built for regular season basketball, just in terms of size and LeBron being able to lock in on a series. And I'll tell you this, and the NBA pays me no attention when I say stuff like this. The first round should be best of five, especially with a play in. First round should be best of five. So I I like that. I there are a lot of I also am a huge proponent of being and I know I said I have a hard out. We can maybe go an extra five minutes here because okay. there's a bunch. Um, I'm a huge proponent in all sports of drafting your opponent. Ooh. So I think if you want to really incentivize uh, the regular season, you make it so. The ones, the one and the two get to draft their first round opponent. And the reason that that is awesome is A, there's real stakes on who gets the one seed, who gets the two. And also, no matter what that first round series, it's like, they, they disrespected us. They picked us. Like, it doesn't matter how obvious it is. Like, that other team is going to be pissed. Like, you want us, you got us. Like, uh, so I really, I, I think the drafting your opponent, it also totally removes the like, oh, we're ducking this team to get this right, team. Right, like, right, right. I think that that would be, uh, I think that is a more likely change than shortening the series because they don't want to get rid of the inventory. But right. you want to talk about, a ra- it would just be a one-off, but that would be a ratings, a 30-minute TNT ratings bonanza would be the playoff opponent draft. The day after the play-in's done, you have Joker and Tatum and Giannis, and it's like, all right, here's who we're taking. One of these teams, like, pretends they're doing it randomly, but every team's name is the Atlanta Hawks when they're drawing it out of it. They're like, oh, who knew? We drew the Hawks. Uh, I think that would be awesome. I want to ask you a question. Okay. Uh, uh, Because on TV today, I'm going to – I on mon- so we're recording this Monday morning, so I think people will probably hear it hopefully after the TV show. On TV today, I'm going to pick the Bucks to win the East. We're doing our official playoff predictions today because we kind of waited till post football. We cheated a bit. I I'm not going to act like I feel great about it, but I also feel like the Bucks have been undervalued a bit, and Giannis's season has been totally disregarded. He's averaging career high in assists, almost career high in points, career high in field goal percentage. And people are like, what's wrong with Milwaukee? And obviously, they haven't looked, you know, dominant start right. to finish. But I I like Milwaukee a lot. And I think it could set up what could be in, you know, Jokic Giannis in the finals. Both have two MVPs. Both have a finals MVP. Both are kind of fighting for player Supremacy. of the era. Yes. You know, yes. yeah, and like greatest international player ever other than Akeem is yes. I think on the line and maybe one of them could jump Akeem one day like there's a lot of stakes there so maybe it's just kind of what I'm rooting for yeah. but I think Milwaukee I know Boston has all the metrics and the record and everything I like Milwaukee man Nick if you're asking me am I picking Boston to go to the finals the answer is no and I've and we had this discussion. I had Jerry Greenberg on last week, and I said the stink that Giannis has or the stink that the Bucks have on them from the Adrian Griffin situation has had Giannis in a spot where we've completely overlooked how great he's been individually this year. And the fact that Giannis has come up short in the players, but he don't run from the ball. He don't scare. Like, he may no. miss the free throws, but he ain't running from anything. And Jason Tatum, those clutch numbers look ghastly. And we've seen the Boston Celtics in a way with late games. I don't know if I trust them to get great shots. So I don't trust them to get great shots. What's we- so to be- what's weird is 
So the Giannis discussion has always been weird because we have it on the show and Drew loves Giannis, but he's like, but you can't just give him the ball and say, go get me a bucket. I'm like, well, you kind of can. If the guy averages 30 every year and scored 50 in the finals, you kind of can. Like, it, I understand it's not, it, it, it's more shaft It's not the aesthetic. It's, it's not the aesthetic. Yes, it's the aesthetic. But he's, the, and now, to be, Giannis did seem, the one time I've seen him run from the ball was the end, I don't know which game it was, but round one at the end of that game last year against Miami in round one where he literally. Game six, yeah. Yeah, yeah game five, um, game five. Yeah, that was yeah, a weird. Right. That was a weird one, but I don't think that's who he's been through his career. Right. Tatum, on the other hand, went toe-to-toe with Giannis in that game six a couple years ago in Milwaukee and played the best game of his career, saw him score 50 in a game seven. So I don't think the moment, I don't think he gets scared. I think Tatum's biggest problem is he's he's doing too often a Kobe Bryant impersonation. I was about, I was about to say it. I was about to say it. He's, he, he does things in the last couple minutes of the game that go completely against all the other progress that he's made in his own yes. individual development to this point. Like the clutch test. I'm just going to go through it really quickly. Yeah. He's 15 of 48 this year, 5 of 16 from 3. This isn't a one-year sample size, Nick. Last year he was 27 of 77 in he's the clutch. He's been 38% in the clutch effective field goal percentage each of the last three years. Haberstro did a great thing on this on his sub stack. And so, I, yeah, I mean, I'm... It is a, it is a, it, it's a weird thing. And I do think a lot of it is one of the things that made Kobe special was Kobe was a terrible shot maker, but even Kobe's efficiency, like Kobe took some awful shots, but could make them. But, but Kobe's efficiency suffered because of it. Like Kobe has is, if you look at the raw data, yes. you know, missed a lot more of those than people like to remember. Yes. Um, but Kobe all like Tatum is excellent, but he's not Kobe. And Tatum has But he's six ten. He, that's why I was he can say. shoot Tatum, over the top of people. He doesn't have to do all the Kobe stuff. And he can Kobe obviously can get to the basket. Great, but he is bigger than Kobe and can so there is an element of if the Celtics aren't blowing you out, do you really trust their coaching and execution late in games? Like that's where I'll say in a close game late, I trust Miami more. Now, Miami just had another terrible loss. Like, Miami, I understand that they're ready for playoff basketball, but you don't want to be the eight seed again. Like, you got to get it together, Miami. But, yeah, I don't – and if they – and if Boston this year doesn't win the title, it's a tough spot. It's a really tough spot. Well, Boston has changed everything over there with the exception of their two top players and at some yeah. point you're going to start asking yourself questions about not just Jalen Brown who's who is easy to pick on you're going to ask if Jason Tatum is the number one player on a championship team in an unforgiving Boston market and I will close with this because we brought yeah. up Kobe and we, we started with Kobe and we're going to kind of finish with Kobe in a way because you said Kobe missed a lot more shots than he makes and I will say this is the biggest difference I would say probably between Michael and everybody else or even Kobe and everybody else Kobe could make any shot and he probably missed a lot of shots too. Michael finds a way to always get the shot that he wants. And I think that is a huge, huge difference when we talk about this whole clutch thing, not even a goat thing. That's just a, a difference in like aesthetic and who you trust with the ball in his hands late. That dude's going to pick a spot on the floor and he's going to get there in a dribble and a half. And he's going to pull up and there's probably very little you can do about it. There was, and so I'll go all, all end where we started in talking about older era basketball. There was a, I think I read this in Bill Simmons' book years ago, but Bernard King uh, talked about how he only had a handful of dribble moves and he only practiced shots from a handful of spots. And what Bernard King said was, I have a dribble move if you're guarding me straight up, shade left, shade right, close far. So I only have to practice six dribble moves. It shade me right, close or far, straight up. You know what I mean? Those six moves. Yeah, yeah. And I have six spots in each kind of third of the court, left wing, up top, right wing, that I practice my shots from. You know what I mean? Short, yeah, yeah. medium, far, whatever. And so all my practice time is spent on those six dribble moves and those 18 shots. 
and again, I might be misquoting it a bit, but this yeah, is yeah, the general I get, idea. I get the premise, yeah. And he looked at it like, he didn't say it like this, but almost a math equation. Okay, you are guarding me here. My closest spot is there. The dribble move I'm comfortable with is that one. And so boom, boom, I'm there. And he said, and he talked about that's why he was such a great scorer is he was more, I don't know if he looked at it like this in his era, but efficient with what he worked on. Like, I just need to know what spot of mine that I've drilled 10,000 times I'm closest to and what way to get there. And that was something Michael was probably the best ever at, which was how can I get to the exact spot I want to get to to get the exact shot I want to get? Like that is, un, you know, that is unimpeachable. And that, you know, that is from guys not in the 90s, the 80s. You right. know, Bernard King was great before he got hurt in the 80s. And Michael was doing that in the 80s. Um, yeah. If only Charles he hadn't Bar- put the Charles score Barkley three said times, it best. maybe. Charles Bar- I heard, I had drinks with Charles Barkley, which is always an interesting no. thing, Nick, as I'm sure yeah. you can imagine. Mm-hmm. And he would always say, two moves and two counters. You don't got to do all that dribbling around cones and all that extra stuff. Two moves and two counters, and you can get anything you want. There is an out. There is an absolute element of truth to that, and that is, you know, and you you have you have seen certain guys that have figured that out. Um, and you, I'll say one other thing on Tatum. LeBron, had, LeBron, to, to a point when he was still in his physical prime, figured out where his best real estate was going 100%. to be on the floor. That's when he reached peak LeBron. So the Brew made a point about Tatum. Uh, that I thought was interesting, which is that he watches Tatum and it just feels to him like so much of what Tatum does is from recreating what he drilled on with a trainer. Like, I'm going to go between my legs here. I'm going to do this. I'm then going to hit my step back as opposed to like feeling the, like feeling yeah, what the, it. reading, reading, the, it. reading the game. Yeah. And I had never thought of that. And then I, you know, again, small sample. Then I started watching it with that in mind. Maybe it's confirmation bias. I'm like, oh, that's right. Like, he's like, oh, I have it here. I'm going to do this, do that, and pull up as opposed to kind of more artistry of, like, let me read what's happening and and read and react. So there it is. He uh, never well, changes fun, direction baby. late. He never changes direction late. And that's how that's you right. know it's robotic. Because if you're changing yeah. direction, that means you're reading something in front of you. Oh, defender shading here. Let me let me go and make maybe may turn my hips or something like that. He doesn't do that. He goes straight robotic and it goes against him. And I think it's going to cost Boston. All right. When you guys post this, you guys should post it in the reverse order. We do the real hardcore basketball stuff here and then the LeBron <laughs> stuff at the end. The, Nick, the the plan was to start with the Lakers and then Boston and then gambling and then go yeah. with we're done with the nineties. But you start where you start, and I'm just yeah, gonna follow right. you. Right. That, ladies and gentlemen, is Nick Wright. Check him out on Fox Sports One's First Things First. They got a really cool operation going over there. He, Kevin Wilds, Chris Broussard. Don't forget, he also has What's Right with Nick Wright. He and his son. You can find that on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Anything else you got going on, Nick? No, yeah, that's you get it. another. You I, get another tat- Are you getting another Kansas City Chiefs tattoo? Another, never a doubt. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'll be honest. You know, just re-sign Chris Jones. Uh, the dynasty rolls on, going for a three P. Uh, you know, life's good. I appreciate you, Benny. I'll see you later, bro. I appreciate you. One thing we agree on: Patrick Mahomes, the greatest quarterback I've ever seen. So there we go. Thanks to producer John, the entire team works hard behind the scenes. Dan, we'll be back for another episode of Divine Intervention, and we will be back. Right here on Wednesday with a guy that Nick just mentioned, Tom Haberstro. Wednesdays with Stro for another episode of The Good Word. Until then, everybody be safe.